Hi, I'm Bjorn Eric Willock, and I'm going to take you through a brief introduction to business model innovation and disruption. Now, every company that has ever been created and grown and succeeded has at some point in time been started by, by an entrepreneur, by an individual who was probably rather obsessed with an idea. We're going to have a look at one such individual to make the case in point and explain how business models uh, really work. And that's Henry Ford. This is him in around 1904. Henry Ford, of course, was reasonably obsessed with making cars. In fact, he wanted to make a lot of cars. He wanted to democratize the automobile. Now, just being obsessed with an idea, of course, isn't enough to succeed. In fact, history shows us pretty clearly that if you're going to be successful in the long term, you do need to take a step back and have a look at the context in which you're going to compete. You need to understand the forces playing around in your industry. Now, we have a model for that these days that Henry Ford didn't have at his disposal. It's the five forces model of Michael Porter, which many of you may be familiar with. In fact, Henry Ford himself used this model, even though it wasn't invented yet, uh, very diligently in studying the industry in which he wanted to, to dominate eventually. The competitive rivalry within the industry, so the force in the middle there, there were hundreds of automobile manufacturers at the turn of the century when Henry Ford started out. Uh, in fact, he looked at all the workshop capacity in Detroit, and if he contracted all of it, uh, he could make 70 cars a month. That wasn't going to get him very far, was it? There's lots of possible substitutes, obviously, perhaps the simplest one being the horse and carriage, which was what everybody was using, but you could take the bicycle, you could use your feet, you could just ride a horse, you could ride a boat, you could take a train, and so on. There were threats of new entrants. It was popular, apparently, to get into the auto industry, probably driven by the fact that a lot of industrialists toward the late 19th century had made piles of money in steel, rail, real estate, and having your own brand was a prestigious thing. So many small car manufacturers making a few exclusive cars sort of came out of all these entrants coming in. The bargaining power of the customers, well, the customers weren't exactly falling over themselves to buy new cars. There was some skepticism and exactly how they were going to get hold of the cars and how they were going to maintain the cars. It wasn't quite obvious. So, so they were a skeptical crowd that Henry Ford had to figure out how to reach out to, and he did brilliantly, as we will see. And when it comes to suppliers, not only was workshop capacity in Detroit, which is where Henry Ford was born, limited, but the whole supply chain was unconsolidated, as we would say today. And as you know, Henry Ford innovated that in a lot of different ways, all the way back to uh, the rubber plantations and, and the mines where he would get the, the supply of ore that he would use to make the metal that would make the cars. So looking at these five forces, he made some very interesting strategic choices that were determinants of his future success. Now, here's the thing. The questions you ask around these five forces and the answers you give to those questions or the choices you make, this is what constitutes your business strategy. Nothing else. That is business strategy. Now, when that strategy is then going to be operationalized, you're going to make it come alive, that is when you design your business model. Your business model says something about what you are going to offer, the value proposition, to whom, the customer segments, how you're going to reach the customer, the channels, how you're going to keep the customer and nurture the relationship with them, the money, how are you going to get paid? So that's the right side. What are you going to offer to whom and how are you going to get paid? And then the left side of the business model, with what processes, structures, systems, competences, infrastructures, at what cost are you going to do that in order to create a growing and profitable organization? Now let's have a look at Henry Ford's business model, because it turns out that he was quite a genius in all dimensions of the business model. As most of you know, of course, the value proposition was articulated in the T Ford. Yes, it was black, and the saying that you could have it in any color you wanted, as long as it was black, turned out to be true, not because Henry Ford was colorblind, but he could get black color really cheaply. 
It was a byproduct of the asphalt production used to pave the highways in the U.S. It was also partly owned by Standard Oil and the Rockefellers. So it was cheap and available, and it turned out that it dried very quickly, which was important because he was going to make a lot of cars. Here's his value proposition. Now, who is he going to sell it to? He's going to sell a lot of cars, so obviously he's not going to He's not going to go to the, the rich people and sell a few cars uh, to certain rich segments of the United States at that point in time. And he's not going to go to the poor people because the car was going to cost around $950, which was about a third of other cars, but still quite a bit of cash at the time. So he targeted the emerging middle class. Again, pretty obvious. But then the question is, how is the middle class going to get hold of the car? Are they going to travel to Detroit, uh, leave their horse and carriage there, and then you can have a reselling of horse carriages and a sausage factory for the horses? Or how are they going to get the cars out there? Well, at the end of the day, we all know that we buy cars from dealers, right? Well, guess what? The concept, the notion of a dealer was totally unknown at the time. It did not exist. Henry Ford realized that he needed to create some confidence among these slightly skeptical middle-class people. So he was looking for high-standing people, relatively wealthy ones, in geographical areas that he would give an exclusive right to sell his cars at a defined price with a defined margin, provided that they only sold Ford cars. This model of dealership existed, still exists today, although the European Commission has taken away the exclusivity here a few years ago, but it lasted at least 100 years. So the dealer as a channel was a Henry Ford innovation. Then the question is, how are you going to make these dealers successful? And how are you going to keep these customers coming back? Well, Henry Ford figured out that if he introduced a warranty program, he would encourage people to service their cars, which they would do at the dealer, who would then set up a workshop, and then he could charge for the workshop work in servicing the cars. Henry Ford came up with that idea. He came up with the notion of original spare parts, i.e. your warranty is only valid if you use original spare parts. Henry Ford idea. While your car is being serviced, what do you do? Well, Henry Ford started Hertz car rental. If you don't have $950 in cash in the bank, what do you do? Well, Henry Ford came up with car financing. So an absolute genius on the right side of the business model. And then, of course, on the question of how he was going to do it, well, we all know about the assembly line. And it turns out he got inspiration for the assembly line from what the meatpacking industry calls the disassembly line. He looked at the meatpacking district and in Chicago and the way entire animals would come in and then steaks would go out the other side. And he said, we can do the same thing, but in the other order. And that became the assembly line. And he vertically integrated that all the way back to the rubber plantations and the mines. Absolute brilliant innovation in every dimension of the business model and a very practical way of explaining to people the various elements of the business model as an articulation and an operationalization of your chosen business strategy. It's fair to say that this business model is probably the most copied business model ever been used across any industry you can think of that makes things. But how about industries that don't make things? Well, they've copied a bit of this too, but let's, let's look at an example from more recent times. Let's look at the music industry. This is a wonderful album from ABBA in the late 70s where they came out with Dancing Queen, among other great hits. And you remember the, the vinyl, the long play record? Well, back then, that was the way you could consume music. And if you asked the manager of a record company, What's so hard about being a record company manager? The guy would probably say that, well, it's finding a good artist and finding some good songs and matching the two. Once you had that and you could press an album, the rest was pretty easy because if we think about the right side of the business model, they pretty much had a distribution monopoly. There was no other way to get hold of music other than buying a record. Yes, you could also make some copies on tapes and so forth, but that was never really a threat to this wonderful, juicy industry back in the 70s and the early 80s. Then, of course, the digital revolution came around. We got the CD, so digital music still on a record, though. And then fast forward to modern times, of course, the Internet came around, and today we're all consuming it, either downloading music or 
even more common now, streaming it from companies like, for example, Spotify. And you kind of wonder why did it take so long for a company like Spotify, which launched in 2008, to actually become successful? That's not because it's a technology challenge. It's because they had to get the rights. They wanted to do this legally. Remember back in the 90s when streaming music actually became uh, available or downloadable music became possible from what they called the internet back then? What did the record companies do? Well, for a while they didn't do anything, and then they started complaining about cannibalization, and then they started actually suing people. They actually started suing, and who did they sue? They sued the customers. They sued the mother of two teenagers in Arkansas, and they sued her for $40 million because they downloaded some Rage Against the Machine illegally from Pirate Bay. That's not a very good approach to customer intimacy, is it? So the record companies were just fighting it and fighting it and fighting it and then finally suing the customers. An approach we're seeing now in quite a number of other industries that are being disrupted. But anyway, nowadays they've had to agree to let companies like Spotify and others make the catalogs available for streaming. And they're making money, but in smaller amounts. In fact, not even Spotify is profitable yet. Sadly, there's only one company that's really made a lot of money so far from the availability of music digitally over the internet, and that's Apple. And who would have thought that? Apple makes computers and phones, but of course, as we all know now, they absolutely innovated with the iPod and then embedding the iPod into the iPhones and so on. They absolutely innovated the notion of making digital music legally available on any device. And these are old numbers. In fact, they're the last published numbers from uh, before Steve Jobs sadly passed away far too early. But even at this stage, you can see that these are pretty substantial. Quite a bit of money here. A dozen billion songs at a dollar each. Well, that's some cash. We have TV episodes, we have movies, we have books, and notably hundreds of millions of accounts with credit cards linked to them and the one-click innovation, which is so brilliant and the reason you should never give your kids the password to your iTunes account. But in fact, interestingly, all this money for Apple represents some 4% of their revenues. Apple makes their money from selling nice screens and smartphones, tablets, and computers. So what's the record industry doing in the middle of all this? Well, they're still trying to fight back because the artist and repertoire process, so finding the artists and finding the songs and matching the two, is still something that is an important skill set where they have the contacts and the experience and the processes to actually make that happen. But in fact, that's also being challenged. What is idol? The whole idol concept is about crowdsourcing the entire artist and repertoire process, isn't it? So that's also being challenged. So you add that, the last bastion of the music moguls, to the fact that Spotify and other digital streamers have completely disrupted the revenue models of the music industry. And it's no wonder that people like Jeff Zucker at NBC Universal in 2008 started complaining. They were trading analog dollars for digital pennies. We cannot go along with this. We have to fight it. And they're still fighting it. They're still frustrated about it. Interesting factoid, if we now in 2015 look at the total amount of money circulating in the music industry, all those digital pennies are adding up. There's only a hundred of them in every dollar. There's much more music being consumed. The total amount of money is greater than it was in 2008, but it is accruing to different players in different situations and different markets. The mean time between surprises is getting very, very short in pretty much every industry out there. And these surprises are uncomfortable for established players like the record company moguls. And why is it? Why is it so hard for established companies, for incumbents, to accept and to act upon some of these surprises, some of these disruptions? I spend a lot of time thinking about that. Take the example of Nintendo. You're all familiar with Super Mario. And of course, they have the DS, this device that they, they make themselves, on which they put 
uh, Super Mario and, and other games, and kids would play around with that device. They took that one step further a few years ago with uh, the Wii, where you actually introduced motion and sensors, and you could play some tennis or various uh, yoga or exercise games with these devices, became very, very popular. They were making so much money during the first two years after the introduction of the Wii, in fact, that uh, I read a report where, where uh, Nintendo actually had a higher profit per capita than Goldman Sachs did at the time. Quite successful. Now, let's fast forward. Where do people do casual gaming today? Casual gaming is, well, Super Mario is a good example, Candy Crush Saga, Angry Birds, you name it, that's casual gaming. Hardcore gaming, so sophisticated games, multi-user games like League of Legends and so on, they are done on specialized devices like Sony's PlayStation or Microsoft's Xbox. But casual gaming is being done on our devices, on our iPhones or our Android phones or our tablets, right? What's Nintendo doing? Are they making their games available on these devices? No, they are insisting on continuing to make their own. I mean, look at this quote. Our response is, no thank you. We will make the content and put it in our own devices. Can you believe it? That's like having your head so far down in the sand that only your toes are sticking up. Absolutely incredible. Company after companies try to pretend that the future isn't here. And eventually, it will kill them. This guy, Stan Druckenmiller, is a fav fav famous, sorry, famous investor. He's just put a billion dollar bet that IBM is going to fail in their transition to cloud. In other words, a big short on IBM. He thinks they're going to go south, not bankrupt, but be extremely unsuccessful in a world of software as a service and cloud-based computing. I'm not saying that's going to happen, but it is interesting that when the Central Intelligence Agency contracted out for a private cloud, I guess it's pretty natural that CIA won a private cloud, not a public cloud. IBM, of course, pitched for it and was widely expected to get the job. Amazon won it. Amazon? Where did that come from? I don't think anybody expected it, certainly not IBM. The mean time between surprises is getting really, really short. Some of you may have heard about uh, Google investing $3 billion in a company called Nest. Nest makes two things. They make a, a temperature sensor, a thermostat, and they make a smoke detector. Uh, they're good looking, but they're just a thermostat and a smoke detector. For $3 billion, what on earth is going on here? Well, it turns out that what Nest is doing is making these things connected to the internet, creating protocols that Google believes can become widely accepted and finally lead to the future of home automation, which is interesting to Google, who of course want to know as much as possible about us in any walk of our lives in order to target their advertisements better. But it is very interesting that it's not the incumbent companies, it's not the Siemens, the Philips, the Lucky Gold Stars, Samsungs, Honeywells, or GEs that come up with this innovation. It's a small startup called Nest, which is acquired by Google. So why is it that these established companies have such a hard time at cracking the future and adapting to inevitable change? Here's another one you may have heard about, GoPro, you know, these action cameras that people put on them when they do extreme sports, downhill skiing, surfing, what have you. Well, it's a fabulous international success, making tons of money for the two surfers who now work out of Denver, who started it. But it's very interesting that it came out of photography-interested surfers. It wasn't Canon or Nikon or any of the other established companies that came up with the idea. What is it with these incumbents that they cannot think outside the box? One observer of large companies Dominic Barton, the managing director at McKinsey, who probably meets more CEOs than, than any of us, phrased it this way. Technology is moving three to five times faster than management. So the management, the executives are harding, finding, having a hard time keeping up with the disruptive forces of this technology. And we see this if we apply it to the business model because Typically, if you ask a CEO or a CTO or a CMO or a CXO, if you will, 
what part of the business model do you focus on? They will typically talk to you about the right side. So what are we going to offer and to who are we going to offer it and how are we going to make money? And they every once in a while come up with some pretty innovative and inspiring ideas and then they throw it over to the left side, the engine room, the processes, the structures, the systems, and these structures are usually not prepared to deliver on the innovations on the right side. And this, in our opinion, is one of the key reasons why these big established players have a hard time innovating. It's not that they don't see the great stuff that's coming, but they're stuck in very inflexible structures. Because what happens here is that new players like low-cost airlines, they start from scratch. The existing ones, they really have to make huge changes from our home market in Scandinavia. We know the story of Scandinavian Airlines, of course, the established Scandinavian airline that is owned by three governments, Norway, Sweden, and Denmark, um, long had a monopoly situation. Notably in Norway, when Norwegians, starting from scratch at the turn of the century, decided to start flying. And SAS, just like the record companies, did everything they could to try to bankrupt Norwegian. They sued them. They dumped the prices on Norwegian routes. They played like a classical monopolist, not because they're evil, but that's a pretty common way to respond. And Norwegian just kept growing and growing and growing and currently have over half the domestic market in Norway and are growing hugely also internationally and are in fact a bigger airline than SAS at this point in time. And if you confront people at SAS who've worked there through the years with that fact, one word that comes back in those dialogues, I've had a few of them, is unfair. It's not really fair. I mean, Norwegian have brand new airplanes. And all the airplanes are the same kind. SAS have older airplanes, and they have eight different types. All of Norwegian's planes have the same engine, and they're modern, fuel-efficient engines. Most of the SAS ones have older engines that are not so fuel-efficient. Norwegian doesn't have any unions. SAS have almost more union than they have aircraft. It's hard to be the incumbent. It's not impossible, but it's difficult to get out of the box, and your structures, your legacy, are weighing you down. You know about Kodak? Of course, invented photography. Hugely successful business model based on chemistry, of course. Photography is about chemistry. But George Eastman designed a business model whereby he made the cameras very reasonable and then he made the film and the actual development of the film quite costly and a fabulous business model based on printing. And as most of you, I think, know, Kodak today is gone and bankrupt. What went wrong? Of course, we stopped printing. Photography with old-fashioned or classical analog cameras was replaced by digital cameras and to an increasing extent also by our devices, our iPhones and so on, that we use for photography. And we don't print anymore. We post and we share the photos that we make. Now, didn't Kodak see that coming? You bet they did. They invented the first digital camera. They were very close to the notion of posting as well. They came up with something called the Kodak frame, which was a nice little internet-connected frame that you could put on grandma's fireplace, and you could send different pictures to it. That reminds us of something rather similar that we're doing with pictures today. But the revenue streams from those digital business models were nowhere near replacements for the rapid decline of the traditional analog printing development business model and the internal forces of Kodak supporting the old way of doing work were too powerful for the new ones to be able to flourish. And the company, which at its peak employed 145,000 people, is gone. But all is not lost. Fuji, their biggest competitor, is actually thriving. Now what happened? They had exactly the same business model as Kodak back in the 80s and early 90s. Exactly the same. They saw the same transformation coming, the same big change to digital. They realized early on that the digital revenue streams had no chance of replacing the analog printing ones. 
and thought very hard about what else could they do. And they did some pretty innovative stuff. They realized that their core competency resided not only in chemistry, but in a specific field of chemistry around antioxidants. Antioxidants, which is what is needed for pictures to maintain the color over a long period of time. Antioxidants can also be useful for skin care. So Fuji launched a very successful line of cosmetics, which to this day is huge across uh, Asia. Not only that, but in fact today, if you look at what Fuji really does and their biggest success story, it is actually a completely different kind of film. If I take out my phone here, the covering surface of sophisticated screens is covered by a film, a thin film of material that's crucial to get the right kind of display. Fuji has 85% of that market. How about that for a transformation? Two companies in exactly the same situation. One went bankrupt because they tried to walk backwards into the future, and one is thriving because they took it full on. Now, today, of course, what do we do with pictures? Well, as I mentioned, we snap them with our devices, we post them, and we share them. And you might say that it's not Kodak's fault that they didn't predict Facebook. But imagine if they had. Imagine if they had. They were so close with the Kodak frame, for example, and their digital camera. Imagine if they had predicted Facebook. They could have done that. They could have launched that. And one of the challenges we have when we work with companies around business model innovation and disruption is to help them think out of the box, help established companies think like the disruptors and do something about it. <laughs>